This is Office Talk with Annette Stepanian. Hi everyone, it's Annette Stepanian here with a new episode of Office Talk. And this week we're talking to Michelle Loretta. If you don't know Michelle, she is one half of Sage Wedding Pros. It's a consulting business that they've created for professionals in the wedding and events industry. So if you are in the wedding and events industry, definitely listen up because she has some great advice to share. But if you're not, I think you can learn a lot from her journey of leaving accounting at a big firm to exploring some different creative pursuits to finally finding what she does today. So let's go to the show. Hey everyone, it's Annette and I am here today with Michelle Loretta, who is the co-founder of Sage Wedding Pros. So if you're in the wedding industry or the events industry, if you don't know Michelle, you definitely need to be listening today. So hey Michelle, thank you for being here. Hi Annette, thank you so much for having me. No problem. I am thrilled to have you here because I know a lot of people are going to get a lot of insight and walk away with a lot of tidbits that you're going to be sharing today. So Michelle, your background is pretty extensive. So why don't you just tell us where you started, how you started, how you ended up doing what you're doing today? Yeah. So I started in the finance and accounting world. I studied accounting at USC in Southern California. And from there, I went to go work at Deloitte, which is one of those big accounting firms. I soon discovered that I didn't want to stay on the accounting track. I actually think I was kind of young and a little immature at that point. And you'll see when you learn a little bit more about my journey, how I've almost come full circle. From there, I went to work for a company that imported and distributed children's clothing from Europe, which is a really great experience learning a lot about marketing, learning a lot about selling, learning a lot about branding. And in that job, it was a really small company, really neat company, but I didn't have anywhere to grow. And I had an entrepreneurial bug to start a business. I'd always loved stationery and paper. And I was at a point in my life and my career where I said, you know what, I'm going to start my own business. It was 2004. I didn't know anything about stationery or design, but this was a time where people started doing what everybody pretty much does these days, launches a website and can start a business. I mean, that sort of thing didn't really exist until the mid 2000s, where you could set up a site and compete with some of the big stationery companies. I know that's something that's a little bit taken for granted these days. But in those days, people weren't doing those things. We didn't have the support of like Squarespace and a lot of these do it yourself, small business services didn't exist QuickBooks for small business and those sorts of things. So started the stationery business taught myself a lot about design moved to Seattle, where I think I was really in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. My business did really well in Seattle. But then in 2008, the economy started sucking. (laughs) To put it, yeah, a lot of people that were in business at that time will tell you the same thing. Like 2008 to 2010 was the hardest time for small businesses. And the wedding industry was suffering. People were getting married less. Guest lists were going down from 200 guests to 50 guests. So with wedding invitations, I was still getting the same number of jobs, which is great. But all of a sudden, I wasn't producing 100 to 200 piece orders, I was producing 50 piece orders. And so in terms of financial viability, that started crushing my business, like a lot of people in the industry at that time. And so my goal was to network with people on a wider scale, and try to do business with people not just in Seattle. And so I wanted to start a blog, I thought that was a great way to reach people nationwide. And I am not a creative writer specifically. I have a business background. And so I tend to feel more confident talking about business topics and meaty information. Uh, Hats off to everybody who writes something creatively or who writes about artistic things and beautiful things. For me, that is incredibly (laughs) challenging. So that's why I started writing Sage Wedding Pros. That's what it started out as, a business blog for the wedding and event industry to provide insight on how to have a stronger business. And my goal for it was really to network with people nationwide. Twitter was just getting started, which is kind of funny to think about these days. Not that many people do. Right. I mean, I think of it these days. But I mean, our site would be nowhere if it wasn't for Twitter. But that was so long ago. (laughs) I think about that too, all the time. I'm like, when I went to USC as well, there was no social media, like Facebook was just starting and some I think like my friend was going to Harvard at the time. So she had like a Facebook account. She had like a Google account, like even Gmail was like invitation only back then. Yeah, yeah. um, Yeah, it's crazy to think I'm like, wow, we didn't study. It's like you can get like a degree in that now. 
yes. at these schools. So yeah, and so that's something that's been really interesting in the two businesses that I've had is you know when I started my stationery business in 2004, social media didn't exist. So people really relied on face to face relationships. And I think that that is still really, really, really important. But then in 2008, when I started or 2009, when I started writing the blog, it was really the social media that made the blog take off. And so the blog a few months in just gained a lot of traction. In those days in 2009, there weren't that many people talking about the business side of events. There was a lot of education about how to be a wedding planner, a lot of training through some of the larger organizations and people teaching the creative side of business and not that many people talking about how do you track advertising return on investment? How do you uh, create a financial strategy? How do you write a business plan? And so that series actually our 13 step business plan was one of the first things that really took notice and people started asking us for more education. And that's when I partnered with Kelly, who's my business partner. And we started teaching the simple plan first in the workshop format. And that's really how Sage Wedding Pros became a consultancy on its own. It didn't set out to be like that, but it's really wonderful. I don't do stationery anymore. I spend most of my day consulting small business owners, primarily in business planning and financial strategy consulting. And so that's when I said I've come full circle in my career. (laughs) I wanted to step out of the accounting and I found myself back here. It's because I have kind of been, you know, done the whole circle and I realized, you know what? I love the strategic side of business. I'm much stronger in here. I'm not an artist. I'm much better in the analytical side of business and you never know where you're going to land. So (laughs) it's funny because just hearing your story, it's so similar to mine and my journey of, you know, I was at the law firm and then I quit and I started this jewelry business to do this creative thing. Although I learned a lot from it and I love the creative side, it just wasn't speaking to my strengths. And then now I'm merging the two, you know, doing law for creatives and entrepreneurs. So it's funny and it's so interesting to hear. I mean, this has been what for over the span of maybe 10 years worth of effort and to hear it summarized in like two, three minutes and you're like, oh, and then I did this and then I did this. But there's so much that goes in between, you know, like so much that goes like, what am I going to do if I leave Deloitte like and start, you know, go do this other job of exporting clothes and then what am I going to do starting a stationary business? What the heck do I know? It's so easy to just to like kind of gloss over it Mm -hmm. in a summary like this. So can you tell about some of those, talk about some of those difficult decisions, like when you're like, okay, I'm going to quit the stability of, you know, being at a big firm or having oh my a gosh. steady job, it's... and then I'm going to do stationary? Yeah. Like... <laughs> oh, it's terrifying. I mean, my whole circle is 20 years because I'm a little bit older than you. So that whole circle that I've just discussed is 20 years. And so a lot of times when I am talking with people that are kind of making that first bold step there maybe where I was like five or six years into my career. And it's like, Oh my gosh, it's super scary. That first step was me sitting in the CPA exam and having like an identity crisis and realizing that I didn't want to do accounting while I was sitting there in the exam. It's the worst thing ever. And I remember driving home and calling my mom and crying and saying, I'm such a quitter. And (laughs) And she was like, I expected her to be mad at me or something. And I remember her saying, like, you're not a quitter. She's like, if you quit on something that you love and you have spent so much time and energy into and you just quit and give up because you just don't want to do it anymore, that's a quitter. She's like, you're not quitting something if you don't love it. Go find something that you love doing. And so that was really reaffirming. And at the same time, like, I now realize that I had to go through a few other steps like you did, too, where... I had to find the right place for me. And it wasn't the artistic side, but I'm glad I tried that. I'm glad I got to experience that. But yeah, I mean, careers take so long. And I I know that at five years, I thought I I had to have it figured out at that point, five years out of college, or, you know, even 10 years out of college. And it's like, careers are so long, it could take you a good 15, 20 years to to find out where you really want to be or need to be. And that's okay. Yeah, because I mean, we're evolving, right? I mean, I I just think it's so silly when we ask kids, like, what do you want to be when you grow Mm -hmm. up? Like, what does a kid know? And then like, you go to college and they're like, I remember at USC, like you had to pick your major. And I was, I think I was undecided for the first two years because I wanted to give myself time to explore, even though I knew I always wanted to start a business. But I just like, I don't know, I'm like 17. Like, you're asking me, what do I want to be when I grow up? And so I think 
it's important to understand that it's an evolution and you change, your circumstances change, you know, things mm-hmm. I even wanted to do five years ago, it's different. Like I'm married now, you know, like mm-hmm. it's a different ball game. Yeah. And I think it's good to have those experiences where you are floundering, where you're young. You know what? And to be quite honest, where you're working for other people. I know that at that time when I was young and when I said at the beginning of my story that I was kind of immature and a little naive. Now looking back, that experience that I had at Deloitte, I wouldn't be able to help people in their businesses these days if I didn't have that experience. And so, you know, in working with sometimes with people that have that are still working a day job, I said, you know what? Take everything you can from this day job, whatever it is, whether you are working in the same field or another field, like let's say you're working as a project manager for an engineering company, use all of those skills in project management, learn from that, learn about managing other people because when you and your wedding business, let's say, need to manage other people, need to lead projects, which are weddings, you can use that experience. I value that experience from my other jobs. I think it's made me so much stronger at doing what I do today. And so it's okay to have those years where you're not necessarily happy in your career, but milk it for what it's worth. (laughs) Because it's so hard to learn those things when you're working for yourself, to be quite honest. I'm like nodding yeah. my head like vigorously yeah. and you can't yeah. see it because it's a podcast, but I'm like, yes, everything she said. And I think sometimes the corporate world gets such a bad rap, like mm-hmm. everybody's trying to run away from it, but it's an amazing experience to the extent that, like you said, you could cultivate and hone in on those transferable skill sets. That's invaluable. That's going to mm-hmm. take you further than any paycheck is going to. So Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I've been on my own for now 12 years and I love it. I love every day of it. But I know that I'm not learning in the same way that I did when Deloitte was training me when somebody else's dollar was training me, I have to go seek out the training, I have to go teach myself things, which is fun and exciting. But you know, when it's on somebody else's dime, and when you're working with other people who are challenging you in a different way, sometimes in a really hard way, those experiences are huge. I mean, I worked for somebody who was not the easiest person to work with. But my difficult relationship with him and that job and that client we were assigned to has made me so much better at conflict resolution with, you know, employees or clients or those sorts of situations that I have found myself in. If it wasn't for that difficult situation, I don't know if I'd be as prepared to have my own business, to be quite honest. Yeah. Or maybe not not as strong at at it for sure. So, Yeah. yeah. So you touched upon some advice that you give other industry folks. Can you just share a few tips over the years that you've kind of seen and just advise people on? Like if someone's starting an event planning business or has been at it for maybe a year or two, what are some tips that you could give them that they could excel or propel their business to that next level? Yeah, you have got to two things, I think, carve out time to work on the business. I know a lot of people talk about this, but not a lot of people actually religiously do it. And when I'm saying carve out time, you need to have that at least I'd say four hours every single week to work on the business. And I'm not talking about doing admin work and doing accounting. To me, that's just the nature of getting your day to day done. I'm talking about building strategy every single week, taking a look at your goals, seeing where you're at, taking a look at your business plan, reassessing, is this still working for me? You need to have that strategy time because as the owner of the business, a lot of us start businesses. I mean, me, even in my days in stationary, you just get bogged down by your clients and by the creative side of the business. But first and foremost, when we start a business, that entrepreneurial title is the most important because everything else will fall apart if you don't have the time set aside for that strategy. And the second thing is to partner with people who know more than you do, specifically in areas that you don't feel very confident and comfortable in. I think that's the hardest to do because you have to admit, you have to admit, I'm not good at this. I need help with this. It could be a peer and you meet every couple weeks and you talk shop and you find new ways to help each other out and improve certain areas of your business. It could be hiring a bookkeeper if you know that you aren't going to be updating your QuickBooks. But you need to recognize those areas that you're not strong in. If you're not good at managing people, you may need to hire a manager to do that. Recognize those areas, take inventory of those areas that you aren't strong in and hire people or use resources, mentors, friends, peers to help you build greatness and make sure that those people that you are partnering with on one level or another can actually help you. 
I know there's a lot of like, it's great because there's a lot of peer to peer advice that happens these days, which I love. I wish that had existed on a, a scale to which it does these days. I always had friends in the industry, but these days on social media, it's amazing, especially like Facebook groups and things like that. Amazing. But there's also a lot of people that are just getting advice from people that are in the same boat as they are and maybe not always the strongest advice. So make sure that you are very choosy when you're selecting people that you're partnering with to get expertise from, whether it's, again, a peer, a mentor, a coach, employees, managers, you know, experts, lawyers, accountants. Make sure that those people, you know, that you kind of do a little due diligence to know that if they can truly bring your business up. Yeah, you can't work on your business in like 140 characters or less, no. you know. Oh, yes. And and I always say like Google is not your lawyer, you know. It's yeah, you, Oh my gosh, you're so right. Yes. And it's a great tool and there's so much noise and there's so much information coming at us and you have to find a way to manage these tools and utilize them in a effective way. And mm-hmm. just because it's on the internet, it's not necessarily true. <laughs> yes. Yes. And yeah, everybody has a platform nowadays. So yeah, good advice. You know where I see it come up and you probably sent it to a little bit from the legal, but this is more of a tax issue. People don't realize is the advice that people give each other in this industry to hire contractors. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many times I've seen somebody said, well, you know, so-and-so has contractors and this is how they do it. So I'm going to do it. Not really realizing that that person, you know, maybe even if they've been in business for a few years, that they should actually be classifying those people as employees. I mean, that's one area of advice that I see passed around so many times that's hurting people in our industry. Yeah. So what other things are you like while we're at it? You know, what are some other pitfalls that you see people kind of falling into? I think going back to what we were saying about social media, social media is such a strong tool. I mean, like I've said, Sage Wedding Pros, if it wasn't for Twitter and just ongoing social media, you know, I don't know if people would have found us so easily. At the same time, in my 10 years, 12 years in this industry, I can say that those face-to-face relationships, that never changes in terms of moving your business forward. So make sure that you're getting out there and meeting people. And this goes for for people not in the industry that are listening to just small business in general, networking, building relationships, not just online, but in person, those recommendations, those referrals, those relationships, and those friendships, those are the ones that are going to move your business forward. Social media changes all the time. So people had put so much weight into Facebook five years ago and promoting through Facebook, and then they started charging for the boosted ads, and it became a less effective way for small business owners to get noticed. Twitter. Twitter used to be a huge way. And now communications aren't happening, at least in our industry, not as often. Instagram's going through a ton of changes right now. And I know a lot of people have been incredibly successful with Instagram. We don't know where that's going to be in three to five years. Same thing with advertising. Advertising has changed so much. One year, one site will be amazing. The next year, another site will be amazing. What I have always seen, though, is that the relationships, if you can make friends with other photographers and filmmakers and wedding planners and venue owners, that never changes. Those recommendations recommendations and being able to build your business on that word of mouth is always tried and true. That hasn't changed in the 12 years and even longer than I've been in business. Yeah. So So talk to me about Sage Wedding Pros. So you do the consulting. You have this conference coming up. Tell me some more about that. Yeah. So Be Sage Conference, this is a conference we started doing three years ago. I mentioned the Simple Plan Workshop, which is a workshop we've been doing now for seven years. Be Sage Conference is specifically geared at experienced wedding professionals. So typically people somewhere in the two to 10 year range, people that have gotten past that struggle of the startup years where they feel like they have a successful business and they're trying to figure out What are the next steps for me to keep growing? I have a really strong marketing strategy. Financially, my business is performing well. I feel like my events do very well also. And I need to figure out what are the next steps for me? How do I continue evolving my business? How do I continue growing as a business owner? And so we developed the conference based on questions that we would see come up from a lot of our clients and a lot of people who have attended past workshops on how to keep shifting their business forward. And so we develop the curriculum upon these questions. We first come up with what we think are the greatest needs in the industry for that level of experience. And then we find the right people to talk about it. It's really important for us to have people inside the industry, but also outside of the industry feel that there's so many things that people are doing in other industries that we think we can apply into our industry and, and learn from. 
so this year we're doing it in Cabo, which is really fun, exciting. A lot of brainy stuff, but we're hoping sand and margaritas as well. <laughs> so some of the topics that we're covering are how to expand beyond just doing weddings. So we've heard from people that want to get into maybe more corporate events or specialty events. And we have Jessie Hack from Orange County. She's coming to talk about that. She's an event designer. She's amazing. And she's done a lot of really great events with Brit and Co with other technology companies in the last few years. And she's really managed to, and she's continuing to evolve herself. So it's kind of fun to hear her, her experience and being successful at it, but also kind of learning what has been working and what has not been working. We also have John Scrofano. He is the CEO of Garmin Tori. He's coming to talk about how to utilize other people's money. So that's the <laughs> title of his talk. We've heard from a lot of people that want to learn a lot more about how to finance a business. So what does it mean to take on a bank loan if you want to grow your business? What does it mean to take on an investor? What are different investors that you can look at? What is the reality of our industry's service-based business? It's not like a technology company. We're not going to be able to shop for angel investments and VCs. You're not going to go to Shark Tank. Probably. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, but at the same point, there are people who maybe they want to start a product line to kind of expand on some of the things or maybe even license something that they've done. So he's going to talk about the experience of getting financing and what that means for a service-based business or a service-based business who wants to expand maybe into product and yeah, I don't know, go on to Shark Tank or something like that. That's one that a lot of people have asked us about. You know, I have a really wonderful like private studio doing flowers. How do I move into a brick and mortar that I want to move into and start doing some shop designs and maybe even expand into a few locations? I mean, that that typically will take some sort of investment from something. And what does that look like? Yeah. So he's going to be talking about that. He's wonderful because he actually has a lot of experience in the wedding industry with a few different technology startups that he's had in the last 12 years in the wedding industry. And now he's in the apparel business. So he can share about that as well. And then one of our other speakers that we're really looking forward to is Felicia Hatcher. She is going to be talking about how to become an epic expert. And I think anybody that's been in business for 10 years needs to be thinking about how to utilize some of that past experience in the industry to bring them more opportunities and whether that means speaking gigs at conferences or whether it means using your name for other things. Again, maybe, maybe it is licensing, maybe it is relationships on a bigger, broader national scale, becoming a spokesperson, even on a local news channel. How do you use your expertise and how do you communicate to the world that you are somebody to be trusted and to be listened to? Felicia's wonderful at that. I've heard her speak here in Miami. And she's a really great source of that. And she's been able to do that herself for her own businesses. So we're really looking forward to hearing her. So those are just a few of the people that we're having talk. That sounds like really good stuff, like really practical, meaty, substantive topics that yeah. people could get a lot out of and then go to the beach and sip on margaritas in the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> It's the best of all worlds. Well, I mean, that's our big thing is, yeah, it's wonderful that everything's gonna be at the beach and everyone's gonna have a great time. We have a couple parties that go with it too. But at the end of the day, the things that we pride ourselves on is to teach people how to do things in their business, meaty substance, not fluff. We want people to walk away with tangible steps on how to do these things, not just an inspirational talk that people walk away feeling excited the first day and then not really knowing how to implement it. So mm -hmm. That's something we really pride ourselves on and that's something we really push our speakers to be doing and be communicating the steps to do all these things because without that, people don't really know what to do when they get home, to be quite honest. Yeah. So it seems like conferences are kind of like lately, you know, a new, it's not new, but it seems like everybody's kind of doing a conference or a workshop or but you've been doing this for a while. And as you know, being someone in the events industry, what kind of advice do you have for people who are like, well, I want to bring, you know, I have this knowledge. I want to create some sort of workshop. I want to create that face to face interaction with yeah. um, customers and clients. Like how does somebody go about somebody who's maybe not in the events industry, yeah. how does someone go about finding these speakers or kind of wrapping their head around how to produce an event like this? Yeah. So it does help that we have event experience. So the event side, I would recommend definitely partnering with somebody who has event experience. But before that, you really need to think of what is different with this education. I think the challenge that people have these days who are launching a new workshop or a new conference 
is, well, two things mostly is finding something that's really different to be able to sell that has a lot of substance and being able to communicate exactly what it is that people are going to be learning, walking away with and how their business is going to change. Again, that education has to be different because there's so much overlap that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing as an organizer that I think is the hardest thing to do is getting people in the seats. It's not as easy as just announcing and telling people that you're going to do the conference and then hoping that tickets are going to sell. So what I see happen in the wedding industry is selling weddings is somewhat passive. You place an ad, but at the end of the day, you're waiting for brides to come with you. You never, you're not going to cold call brides. (laughs) So it's a very passive type of sale. The most active you can be is in networking with your other vendors and being seen and, you know, being in the community and things like that. That's the most active you can be, but you're really never selling directly to the bride. You're just kind of waiting or the groom, you're waiting for them to come to you. But with workshops and conferences, it's very different. You have to be really actively selling. And so you need to be okay doing that because it's a lot of work. That hustle never ends. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's again, maybe it's you go on social media, you see like, oh, everybody's doing a workshop or a conference or whatever. But there's so much that goes behind it. Again, goes full circle to what you initially said, which is, you know, finding those people who have that experience who can kind of complement your skill set. So same goes for a workshop. You know, if you don't have that experience or you don't like selling or you don't like organizing things, but you just want to be out there, you know, getting the speakers together, whatever, finding those people who can complement your skills to produce that event is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And knowing the financial strategy going in, you know, in my brief survey of people who do workshops and conferences, it's hard to make it a viable, profitable thing. Yeah. So I think if you kind of know those numbers going in all the costs, and then realistically, what you can sell, that'll make it a little bit better. There's far too many educational things that lose money these days. And it's hard. It's a lot of investment to put into a workshop and a conference. Yeah, it is. But I think it also serves some maybe some intangible benefits and returns, you know, like it positions you as an expert, you know, maybe other companies will start coming to you for your consulting services. So sometimes you can't monetize or oh my gosh and I'm glad you bring that up because I always tell people I'm like you know what you have to think of something else that you want to do this for that's maybe not financially related because this thing may not make money and so you need to think about what is the opportunity there for you or for the speakers or you know how else is it going to help your business or where you want to put yourself, like you said, promotional marketing opportunity for sure. Yeah. Well, I just have another question. Actually, I wasn't thinking about asking this, but for speakers. So how do you go about finding the speakers? Like, I know there are a lot of people that I work with that would love to have the opportunity to speak at a conference like B-Sage or any other conference. Like what stands out to you when you're trying to identify a potential speaker? So with B-Sage, typically, I think that's a little bit harder for us to find a fit with speakers because we typically have a list of topics in mind. And so we're typically trying to find the right person to speak on something that we already have in mind as opposed to to receiving a list of applications and and ideas. It's very rare because we usually have a list. But that's helpful to know because as someone who is trying to, you know, apply or pitch themselves, you want to think, okay, like, where do I fit in? You know, what is their agenda? What is their vision? And how can I take what I know and kind of make it fit into their vision? So I think that's actually really helpful information. Well, and so I would say, you know, for B-Sage and also for, I'm going to say for any conference or workshop you want to speak at, you need to know what that conference is all about and pitch specifically to that conference. So B-Sage is targeted towards experienced people. I'd say 95% of the applications we get are for people who want to speak on something pretty entry level, which is wonderful, but that's not the purpose of this conference. Like it might be a better fit for something else that we do. And there are a lot of times that maybe I can recommend them to another organization that is a better fit. But something like coming up with a marketing strategy may be a little too vague for this audience. And so you really have to know the audience when you're pitching to an organization that you want to speak at. And then pitch, be specific. A lot of times we get emails from people who want to speak. Hey, I want to speak at your conference. It looks great. Let me know if you're interested. 
I want to know what is it that you want to speak at and why should I give you the platform? So what is your background? What's your experience? It helps if people have speaking experience, but I'm actually more interested in learning either what it is that they bring to the industry that is new and different or what sort of outside experience. We love outside experience. We love hearing from people that aren't even in this industry because like I said earlier, somebody who's doing something, let's say in the technology spectrum, that's totally new and different and foreign to us is something that we can say, hey, the wedding industry needs to be doing this too. Where's an opportunity for us to be doing this mirroring what's happening in that industry. So again, know what the conference is all about or the workshop. Be very specific in your pitch and how you can help that person in the audience. And then you're going to have a much easier time at getting recognized, even if it isn't for the first year to the second year. There are a lot of people that in the first year, maybe we didn't even have a fit or this year we've already kind of, we've closed up our speaking for 2016, but I've already looked at 2017. I was like, Oh, that person, even though I wasn't sure about their topic as a fit, I liked the background that they gave. I liked how specific they were in their pitch. They were very eloquent in what they had to share with me. They're definitely somebody that I want to keep in mind for future conferences. Mm -hmm. And that's the third thing I'd say is try again. Yeah. If it's not fit in one year, try again. And get experience speaking at local things. When Kelly and I started speaking, we weren't speaking at big national conferences. We were speaking to local organizations until we had 10 of those small little things on our resumes that then became a powerful tool for us to share. Like these are the things that we've been asked to speak at. So start locally. A lot of people want to speak at the bigger things, which is great, of course. You know, we all want to do that. But showing, you know, I've spoken at these 10 things. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, and if you go back and you kind of look at some of those big players in the speaking world and you dig, I think like Brendan Burchard was like speaking at like high schools or something, (laughs) you know, for years until like now he has a course with Oprah or whatever. I don't know how much he makes to speak, but probably a lot of money, but it's just, you have to start somewhere. So awesome. Well, Michelle, Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all the nuggets of wisdom. And I would love ending the show with asking each of my guests this one question to fill in the blank. And so the question is, the one thing I know for sure is... The hustle never ends, but it always <laughs> pays off. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So it's a perfect, perfect end to an amazing story of how you've just kind of come full circle with everything that you've done and you're now doing something that you love, you enjoy, that you're giving back to an amazing community. And so with that said, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. This was really fun. Thanks, Annette. Oh, you're a doll. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So there you go. After Michelle and I stopped recording, she generously offered a discount for you guys for $200 off the ticket price to her conference. Now remember, that's the one happening in Mexico in Cabo San Lucas in November of 2016. So if you're interested, you can learn more about it over on her website at www.sageweddingpros.com. And if you purchase a ticket and you use the code Annette, that's A-N-N-E-T-T-E at checkout, you can save $200 off that ticket price. So definitely check out her website. If you want more details about Michelle, you can also head on over to my website at AnnetteStepanian.com slash podcast, and you'll get all the good juicy details over in the show notes. So with that said, I hope you have a fantastic week and I will definitely talk to you later.